Welcome everyone back to the weekly weather podcast and in today's podcast we're going to have a look why we saw so many storms over the last couple of weeks we've seen some major storm outbreaks and in today's video we're going to explain why we have seen these storm outbreaks um, and of course focus in on a specific event and go through some of the details of why that event happened um, through the 18th of May into the 19th where we saw those truly epic storms down in the far southeast. Now at the moment we're not seeing anything like this. Temperatures have cooled down significantly and it does look like it's going to be turning much colder next week but we have seen some very early season uh, thunderiness. Big outbreaks uh, and for some biggest thunderstorms some have seen many many years um so we're going to be going through why we saw those what contributed to their intensity uh, and of course it will help when um we have a look at thunderstorms throughout this season it'll help us have a look at what sort of charts we need to keep an eye on for these big thunderstorm outbreaks because it is very difficult forecasting thunderstorms they're very um because of course because they're from convector base they're very difficult to pinpoint exactly where they're going to pop up exactly what parameters we need to get those intensities similar to what we saw last week so we'll have a look through what the models have been showing just remember if you enjoyed this podcast make sure you like and subscribe and remember to follow me on twitter as well the links in the description also do check out the channel membership um do sign up for that uh, quite cheap and it really does help me out and of course i try to get these podcasts out early to channel members so if you do now have a look over on twitter have a look at some images from it now i show all these images in a, in a video last week but if you haven't seen that video i'll run through these quickly just to show some sort of real uh, real world data um, and uh, some of the lightning strikes we saw so you see here from dan holly on the main the 19th a couple of shots from southeast kent last night not the most electrically active storm where he was but some nice cloud structures visible at times and it was really cool to feel the outflow hit with very gusty winds so you can still see very photogenic storm. If we move up, have a look at Dan Harris posting um, lightning strike images. Uh, lightning strike 7 a.m. yesterday to 7 a.m. today, 19th of May, from the uh, from this website, and some superb thunderstorms across the south and southeast. Uh, if we do scroll up and have a look at Liam Dutton, here we go. 28,000 lightning strikes recorded, and you can see them progressing up through the southeast, through the Midlands, into East Anglia, um, popping up all the way through the evening, and of course many over Europe as well. And we even saw following day some just skimming the far southeast of Kent. Now we've seen more thunderstorms uh, images here from Maidstone. Uh, if we have a look at the Met Office, you can see a radar loop from all the very intense storms. Our biggest thing about these storms, not only were they very intense where we saw the uh, actual cells pop up, but they did have a lot of rain with it as well. So even if you weren't under a direct hit from a thunderstorm, we still saw some very uh, heavy rain. Uh, for example, central London didn't actually see um, a cell go over the top of it, but saw a lot of very heavy rain, seeing a good inch of rain for some in there with the thunderstorm staying to the north and the south of uh, of central London. Now, if you move up, you can see, uh, again, some more footage from these lightning storms, big, big strikes, and again, one, uh, a couple more images right here. Some more pictures of some very photogenic lightning strikes. And, of course, you can see some here with more daylight um, going over uh, the south coast through Brighton into the channel. Um, and, of course, because these storms popped up near Jersey and Guernsey, um, Headed northwards through the Isle of Wight, Portsmouth, Southampton, these areas saw the storms first, Brighton, of course, and then it moved up into the London area through Kent um, and the Midlands and East Anglia as well. So if we do first have a look at some of the satellite imagery. So um, this is going to show us these storms popping up. Now, this is 10 a.m. on the 18th of May, and you can see no evidence of any major storm activity. Now, you may ask, what exactly is storm activity looking like on a satellite map? You'll see it very obviously in a second when it does appear. But what we'll basically see is the big cumulonimbus clouds getting absolutely massive in the atmosphere, and this big white cloud tops. Because at the moment, you can see quite shallow clouds, quite low levels or quite high level clouds, but not spreading through the whole atmosphere. Let's do run it through, get to a couple hours into the afternoon, you can see the first signs of storm activity taking off in the near continent. You can see across parts of Spain, southern France, these real white specks, they're big thunderstorm cumulonimbus nimbus clouds exploding into the atmosphere. And then at around 7, 8 p.m., one hour loop, you see 
lift off just off the coast into the channel that is our storms that have taken off around 7 8 p.m run another hour massive increase in size another hour look at the size of this beast covering the whole of the southeast of england run on another hour and you can see through midnight it is a massive storm system with multiple cells within it a multi-celled system with very heavy rain under all of this cloud before you can see by the early hours it starts to dissipate as it heads over the near continent and you can see through the early hours we see some more storms engaging across northern france we saw those in the lightning loop on twitter and you can see those skimming the far southeast skin again giving some heavy rain and some lightning strikes just off coast um now one thing the reason why we can uh why we saw these storms now we'll go into more detail with sort of temperatures and pressures but just from having a look at the basic satellite imagery you can see very clear skies and really no cloud across italy north africa into eastern europe and that's because we've got a big area of high pressure so yeah in the atlantic a lot more cloud big low pressure you can see swirling out in the north atlantic and you can see wind direction the cloud direction comes from one place, and that is from the south. So we've got high pressure to our east, low pressure to our west, pulling up very warm air into France, Spain, and Portugal. Low pressure out to our west, engaging with this, giving instability, um, and we see these big storms pop off. Um, so that's just the basic overview, really, and that is something always need to keep an eye on whenever we see these sort of systems high pressure to the east low pressure to the west wherever that sandwiches um together where the hot air engages with the instability where we're seeing all these cloud amounts that's where we're going to see these storms pop off so if we do now have a look just at the pressure charts now just have a raw pressure charts and the 850 hpa temperatures for the whole of europe and the north atlantic and then we'll have a look at it on a local scale on meteo seal so you can see initially when this sort of uh, warmer spell started, high pressure rose above Europe, heights risen, and you can see big high pressure over into Central Europe, big low pressure out in the Atlantic. And what we see here is very warm air to our east, cooler air and big instability out to our west, and you see direct southerly winds. And you can see, if we did overlay that satellite image on, you can see where all that cloud built up, where those storms built up, it's just on this boundary here, um, where we see those tighter rise bars um, and the warmer air masses. And you can see through, see through by the evening of the 18th, you see the green colours just get close enough to the UK, giving instability um, and big warm push. We see big thunderstorms pop off before you see it sort of lighting up as that low pressure on the Atlantic decreases intensity. We lose those southerly winds. We see we, we lose that sort of warm tap, that tap of real hot air with big moisture. We lose that and we go into more of a westerly thing, which we've had recently. So do run it back and have a look at the upper air temperatures, which show it even better. See, nothing too warm, but sort of 13th, 14th. But as we get towards the 15th, you see the 10 degree ice firm is gathering to our south. The 10 degree ice firm spreads in, and what we are, we're right on the boundary. So we do get the very warm air just to our east, tapping into it every few days. We saw 27 degrees in Heathrow. And you can see on the night of the 18th, very warm, hot air just to our east through the southeast of England, um, that hot plume coming into the far southeast, and you can see much colder air, a good 15 to 20 degree uh, temperature contrast between the central Atlantic, North Atlantic, and France. And along that boundary, instability, storm, and a storm initiation, and we saw absolute lift off with that very hot air just to our east before things started to cool down a bit. And of course, that hot air lingered over Europe, giving continued thundery outbreaks um, into the weekend um, and very hot conditions as well. It was on mid-30s for quite a few in Central Europe. And it's this typical southerly plume sort of pattern. So it, it just shows you don't always need a massive heat wave and then a breakdown to be seeing these big storms. And of course, it doesn't always have to be daytime either. That is sometimes a, a little bit of an assumption that we need the sun to give us that lift. We've got such an unstable air mass, and such a warm air mass, moist air mass as we have had uh, on this occasion. We have seen these big storm outbreaks. So we do now head over to Meteo Seal and have a look at this quite detailed. Now, if we do start on the 850 HPA temperatures locally, now this is the midday run from the 18th of May. So it is still a forecast, it's not an analysis, um, but it is the most accurate what we've got for this sort of 
local scale. So you can see we're in a reasonably warm air mass, a good sort of 6 to 8 degrees at 850 HPA for most of England and uh, is Wales as well. And what you see through 8, 9 p.m., you see that black line, that 10 degree ice firm, just shifts slightly further inland. We see warmer air encroaching further inland with that plume of thunderstorms before it does dissipate away back into the near continent. And that might look, look, not look significant on this chart, but if we do delve into that a little bit deeper, you'll be able to see that that is the, uh, that, that is the initiation of the storms. So if we do have a look at the theta E value, now if you don't know what this is, this is the equivalent potential temperature. So it is the temperature which a parcel of air, uh, if, it re if all the water vapour in it were to condense, release its latent heat, um, that's the sort of energy that's within it. So it sort of gives us a different view because of course, remember the atmosphere is three dimensions, it's um, and it's got all different layers, so sometimes just looking at one layer of the atmosphere at 850, 850 HPA and looking at one sort of value is not always going to give us the full picture. So that's why we have to compare through different sort of uh, ways of viewing the atmosphere. And the potential, uh, the equivalent potential temperature is a very good way of viewing it. It's not only for warm air masses, but cold air masses, which we ha can have a look at as well. So if you start on 3 p.m., you can see very hot to our south. And what you see through that e evening, when those thunderstorms arrive, you see this massive plume, almost off the scales, getting towards those purples and pinks at the end of the scale of hot air. Big theta E values. Um, so showing a lot of latent heat there, a lot of latent heat getting released uh, into those thunderstorms, and then they drift off. Uh, and this is what fueled those storms. So... On the 850 HPA temperatures, it doesn't look anything crazy, but as soon as you view it slightly differently with the potential equivalent temperature, you see um, you see why those storms have got massive lift off. Yeah, significant storms being seen here. Now we also have to look have a look at the Cape values. So this is uh, the most under uh, most unstable um, Cape. So. Uh, the potential uh, energy uh, available to an air particle, uh, the most unstable air particle, the, the energy available to it. So once we have initiation, this is the energy that can be provided to uh, to the air, so the storms in theory. So if we do run through anything sort of getting to greens and yellows is significant cape. Now, of course, we're never going to be completely off the scale here. We're hardly ever going to get towards the reds and purples and pinks. That is more exclusive to parts of America, uh, more towards southern Europe. But we have even hotter air, even more humid air. Uh, and maybe the UK could touch on reds, uh, maybe slightly pinks in the depths of summer. But we're never going to see anything too off the scales. That's the sort of cape you see with massive multi-celled systems in the United States, massive squall lines, massive supercells and tornado outbreaks. That's the sort of thing you see with them. So we're not going to be seeing anything like that, of course. But as we run through, you can see the most unstable Cape values increase dramatically into sort of the yellows and oranges through the southeast through uh, the evening. So you can see storm initiation across uh, the channel around sort of 8, 9, 10 p.m. Initially with Cape, that Cape increases into the early hours. And that's why we saw another little bout of storms before it does move through and stay in the near continents. Um, and then, of course, we did see some more storms throughout that, the rest of the following days, but you can see very limited Cape values. So they were very much pop-up storms, not these sort of multi-celled systems that we did see. So if you do have a look also um, at the relative storm helicity, um, so this uh, basically, um, again, if you don't know what this means, this is the measure of the potential uh, cyclonic updraft um, in the storm. So basically the amount of lift available, and you can see um, the wind direction on here. So you can see convergent zones will appear, that's where we get wind directions hitting each other, Forcing, temperature, uh, forcing the air particles to rise, but also we have the color gradient here, which is the storm relative helicity, um, which again uh, gives us uh, the uh, potential for updrafts. So uh, again, which, if you don't know, fuels these storms. So you can see, as we head towards around 7, 8, 9 p.m., you can see these oranges down in the far southeast. So increased updrafts from this, and you can see a bit of convergence zones there. You can see where winds coming in from the west, hitting winds coming from the south. Convergence zones over London, and that's where we saw the big storms pop off. So you can see all these factors all combining together, giving big 
big storms. Now, one of these things coming off can give heavy showers, could give the isolated storm here or there. But it's the fact everything came together. We saw the energy, we saw the cake, we saw the theta E values, but we also saw the relative, uh, well, the storm relative helicity, so uh, giving it triggers, giving it ability to rise, uh, and also we saw those storms pop off in the right locations. Um, so, yeah, all things really came together to produce these immense storms. And I just wanted to sort of go through this to show you in future, when we have a look at these charts, what sort of things we need to be seeing for the storms of those intensities. So do finally wrap up this podcast by just having a look at the precipitation, what the actual precipitation was forecasted from the WRF. Now, I've had a look at this already, and it is pretty much bang on from the midday run. Midday run. But to be honest, the midday run you'd expect to be pretty much bang on, um, as it's really forecasting something only in about six hours' time. So you can see those storms forming uh, over the near channel, uh, they actually were a bit more intense early on than this is making out to be. But you can see over the London area, once it engages with the Cape, we've got that storm, uh, the re storm relative helicity, theta E values combining all within that. You can see these massive storm outbreaks, massive orange line there showing widespread outbreaks of storms. And this precipitation chart actually got the size and positioning of these storm systems pretty much bang on. Uh, again, it's not going to show it anywhere near as accurate as uh, sort of in uh, on the live radar, of course, because remember these storms are are yes high resolution, but they're nowhere near high resolution enough to be forecasting uh, sort of storms that can be drastically different, only a mile or two uh, in, in sort of distance change. You can go from massive hail, frequent lightning to lighter rain um, and no lightning in the space of a few miles, really. So it is very difficult to forecast that. And we're never going to be able to say exactly where a massive storm is going to pop up. Um, but this just shows you that if we do follow the models, if we do have a look at what the different sort of uh, parameters are showing, we can pretty accurately forecast positioning and intensity. As I said, not exact storm cells. We can't say exactly your town is going to be seeing a storm. But as you can see here, we have got pretty uh, pretty accurate tools now. Um, uh, we have got a good, good idea where we could be seeing storms over the coming months. So yeah, just want to go through what we've seen over the last week or two, sort of as a review, but also an analysing the charts. Just so over the next few weeks, the next few months, through the summer, when we're undoubtedly going to be seeing more storm risks, we're undoubtedly going to be seeing more of these southerly winds at times, uh, we'll think Fingers crossed we do, unless we have a really abysmal summer, um, it's very likely we do see more southerly winds. Um, and this is the sort of charts we'll be having a look at in the videos once again. So anyway, um, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, uh, subscribe if you're new. And yeah, I'll see you again for another daily video or another podcast soon.